Okay, today we'll discuss pelvic ring injuries. Learning outcomes will be to review the surgical anatomy of the pelvic ring or pelvic girdle, to classify pelvic fractures according to the mechanism of injury, and to define what is unstable pelvis, what is its danger, and to introduce the concept of damage control surgery in pelvic fractures and to outline the scheme for definitive management and lastly we will see what are the complications of pelvic fractures let us start with the surgical anatomy of the pelvic girdle if we see the pelvis from the front view what's called the ab view we'll see two innominate bone formed from the ilium pubis and ischium connected through the sacroiliac joint to what's called the sacrum which is fused sacral vertebrae and at the end of the sacrum there is the from the coccyx. top view so we see from the patient head towards the patient leg we'll see what's called the entrance of the pelvic or pelvis inlet this is the pelvic brain at the inlet of the true pelvis. In this view, we can know if the pelvis after fracture is displaced in this direction, which is the posterior direction. Usually the pelvis will displace in a posterior severe direction. So we need this view to know the amount of the posterior displacement. So the inlet view will show us the posterior to anterior direction of displacement vice versa if we see the patient pelvis going from the patient leg and we aim towards the patient head we see the exit of the pelvis which is the pelvic outlet in this view again we'll see the displacement of the pelvis after fracture in the superior direction so if we need to know about the amount of superior direction or caudal displacement towards the patient's spine or head we'll see it in the outlet view we can do this x-rays the ap view to see the pelvis at a whole and to do what's called an inlet view to see again what the posterior displacement right and the outlet view to see the superior displacement or cephalic displacement. The pelvis is the home of many vessels and nerves. The vessels are either large vessels, which is the aorta, the common iliac, external, internal iliac, and very famous branches like obturator branch, subucutural branch, and also there's a plexus of veins surrounding these arteries inside the cavity of the pelvis and these veins are causing much trouble after injury which is the bleeding from the pelvis again the pelvis is the home of what's called lumbosacral plexus of vein so if we have a fracture of the pelvis in this area called the area of the sacrum the root which is enclosed in relation to this area will be injured which is the l5 root causing foot drop the same example, if we have a fracture in the foramina of the sacrum, the sacral roots will be injured and the patient may have problem in urine or stool incontinence or sexual dysfunction. The pelvis also is the home of many soft hollow organs of the genital urinary system and the bowel. The most famous organ to be injured after pelvic fractures is the bladder, which is in close vicinity to the anterior part of the pelvis, which is the pubic symphysis and the pubic rami. In the fracture of the pubic symphysis, dislocation or fracture of the rami, the bladder may be injured and urine will be extruded outside the bladder. How to diagnose? We do what's called ascending urethrogram and we'll see the bladder is high rising, taking this contrast. If we see the function of the pelvis to know what is, is the stability of the pelvic girdle we should know how we transfer the load from our spine in erect position to the pelvis we transfer this load 
to that sacrum, which is wedged or sandwiched between the two innominate bones. The sacrum is in, co in continuous pressure to go downwards, what's called notation movement at the sacral leg joint, towards the gravity due to the load of the spine. And the pelvis is continuously correcting this notation movement by a counter notation movement to correct the position of the sacrum. If you see this bridge, this called arch bridge, the secret of the stability of this bridge is what's called the keystone. This is stone in the middle of the arch, which is wedged at this position. So if we have pressure on this stone, it will distribute the load to the periphery of the arch, maintaining the stability of the whole structure. The same is in our pelvis. This is the sacrum. After loading the sacrum, it will transfer the load to both iliac uh, bones through the sacroiliac ligaments. To prevent the sacrum from falling apart from this position, we have the wedge shape of the sacrum, so the posterior part of the sacrum is wider than the anterior part to prevent the sacrum from falling and we have these suspensory ligaments mainly the posterior ligaments which is supporting the sacrum holding the sacrum to the iliac uh, crest posteriorly and to the spine so the two factors responsible for the stability of the big girdles again are the shape of the bones the wedge shape of the sacrum and the supporting ligaments so if the disruption occurred in this posterior arch, either osseous or bony disruption like sacral fracture, iliac wing fracture, or osteoligamentous like dislocation of this joint together with fracture of a part of the bone, or a ligamentous pure disruption, all these three factors can contribute to instability of the pelvis after injury. If we talk about the ligaments that support the pelvic bones and preventing them from falling apart from the right position, we will have plenty of ligaments. Actually, there's a very complex plexus of ligaments, either anteriorly or posteriorly. To make these ligaments easier to memorize, we will group them into main three groups. Anterior symphysial pubis and uh, anterior structure ligaments. We have the pelvic floor ligaments, which connect the sacrum to the ischium. One is connecting the sacrum to the ischial tube rosary, is called sacrotubulous ligament. The other is more transverse, connecting the sacrum to the ischial spine, called sacrospinous ligament. And the third group will be the sacroiliac ligaments, either anterior sacroiliac ligaments, and the more important are the posterior. This is the posterior view of the sacroiliac ligaments. So, we can define a stable pelvis after injury is the pelvis that does not have significant injury to the bone and the ligaments and can withstand physiological loads. So, the patient can go after the injury, can walk without harm. To assess the stability of the uh, pelvis after injury, we should know how the pelvic ring is actually disrupted and is the posterior arch is involved or not. How the pelvis is fractured, it's either by high energy trauma, which is most common, or low energy trauma. Low energy trauma examples are osteoporotic fractures, fragile fractures in old patients and evulsion fractures in sports athletes. Let's discuss the most important, which is the high energy trauma. High energy trauma could either affect the ring, affecting the stability of the pelvic ring, or occur outside the pelvic ring. It could occur in the false pelvis through a direct blow to the iliac wing, or it could occur below the true pelvis a transverse fracture of the lower part of the sacrum or the coccyx. But if you have a double break, this is almost always affecting the stability of the pelvic ring. 
This double break is dependent on the direction of the injury. It's either compression from anterior to posterior, called anterior posterior compression, compression from lateral, called lateral compression, or a shearing force from downwards upwards, called vertical shear. And this is the base of what's called young burgers classification. Let us take this classification in more detail. So, in young burgers classification, the direction of injury is either anteroposterior compression, so like you are opening the pelvic bone apart, like you are opening a book. So it's called open book injuries, and it depends on the amount of injury. If there is just injury to the anterior structures, it it will open the symphysis pubis by less than two and a half centimeters. If the ligaments disrupted are the symphysis pubis ligaments and the pelvic floor ligaments together with the anterior part of the sacroiliac ligaments, but the posterior part is still intact, it will open a little bit more, more than two and a half centimeters. And if there is a complete disruption of the whole ligaments all through, including the posterior sacroiliac ligaments, it will even open more and more. So there are grades of opening the book in anteroposterior compression. If we take the other example, which is called lateral compression, the injury is coming from lateral to median, we have lateral compression type 1, which is a compression fracture of the pubic ramon and a fracture of the sacrum. So you may notice that lateral compression is mainly a bony injury. Okay, now in lateral compression type 2, you have the same fracture of the ramon, but posteriorly you have a different injury. The fracture goes through the ilium. And in type 3, this is called rollover injury. Suppose that the car is coming from here, and the patient had this injury, and then the car continued rolling over injury. So in the same direction of injury. So here, you have either type 1, which is the sacrum, type 2, which is the ilium, the same pubic ramai, and then after continuing the injury, we have an opening book of the other side of the pelvis, so it's called rollover injury. And also it's called a windswept pelvis. Why windswept pelvis? If you have a window here, and this is the wind, the direction of the wind, اتجاه الريح, وديت في شراعتين شراعتين للشباك الريح هيجي كده هيقفل الأول شراعة وبعدين يجي على نفس الاتجاه يفتح تاني شراعة wind swept injury wind swept injury okay the third because of injury is called vertical shear it's either like this diagram through the ligaments sacroiliac dislocation posteriorly and anterior through the bone it could be also through the bone anteriorly in the symphysis pubis, it could be through the bone posteriorly. In the sacral foramina, there is multiple injury patterns. So, we know now the stable pelvis can withstand physiological loads, and also we have known now that, that it depends on the integrity of the posterior structures, but how these posterior structures are affected, this is called the stability of the pelvic ring injury. We have grades of instability, either the pelvis is completely stable, is partially unstable, and completely unstable. Let us see how to assess the stability. To assess the stability, we classify the pelvis according to what's called tile classification. If the posterior ligaments are completely intact, no posterior fracture, it's called stable. If the posterior ligaments are partially disrupted, it's called Partial unstable. Why? Because it is rotationally unstable, like open book and lateral compression injuries, but it is vertically stable. And the third part is rotationally and vertically unstable with complete disruption of the posterior ligaments. If we try to group young burgers classification according to the stability using this light traffic system, what will be the stable injuries, rotationally and vertically? These are the mild form of anteroposterior compression and the mild form of lateral compression, which is very small displacement. What will be the 
partially unstable, which is rotationally unstable, but vertically stable. This will be the rest of lateral compression and also the middle of the anterior compression, which is tied to anterior compression with, again, disruption of the symphysis pubis ligaments, pelvic floor, and anterior sacroiliac ligaments. And the unstable vertically and rotationally will be those fractures with complete disruption of the posterior structures. These are the vertical shear and anteroposterior compression grade. Why unstable pelvis is very important to us? Because unstable pelvis means uncontrolled bleeding. If we see the pelvis here, which is not fractured, if we have this hematoma after injury, it will be self-contained, or there is what's called tamponade effect of the intact pelvic ring. But if the pelvis is fractured and the bony are ligam and ligaments, uh, disruptions are severe, so the pelvic uh, nominate bones will be apart, and this will cause what's called volume expansion. Now we don't have control on the amount of blood that is inside the pelvis, and the patient can bleed up to death from this injury. Why the patient can bleed up to death? Because severe bleeding will cause coagulopathy, acidosis, and hypothermia, and this is a vicious circle called the lethal triad of death. Remember this picture, plenty of vessels. We have named arteries, we have bony fractures, and we have multiple venous plexuses, one around the bladder called brevesicle, and one around the sacrum called brevesicle. The sources of bleeding in the pelvis, the most common source is the venous, and this is a good news because if we compress the pelvis, this venous bleeding will stop. 30% from the fracture side and only 10% arterial. Again, the most common mechanism of injury in bleeding unstable pelvis are those with high grade of instability rotationally and vertically. And to pursue compression gate 3 and what else? Vertical shear, right. You know, in the scene of accident, the patient can have other sources of bleeding, like from the chest, abdomen, and limbs. And we may lose the patient if we think more than one time what is the source of bleeding. We need to act as fast as possible bleeding. How to organize our uh, action? We should go through what's called advanced trauma life support. It's very simple. A, B, C, D, E. You know, A is the airway, B is the breathing, C is the circulation, D is the disability, including coma. And the E means you expose the patient to know uh, about the skin condition and in the same time you protect the patient from hypothermia by controlling the environment. What's even more important now in advanced trauma life support is we should report as early as possible if the patient has a catastrophic hemorrhage, if we are suspecting hemorrhage, because we should stop hemorrhage as fast as possible. Because if we don't stop hemorrhage, we will lose the patient. So this is the classic picture. We see the patient in the ER, still we don't have x-rays. We have this patient, maybe have some signs of hemodynamic instability, and now we should know if the pelvis is fractured or not, and if the pelvis is fractured, again, is it unstable pelvic fracture, which will cause more bleeding, or it is a stable pelvic injury. How to guess? about this without x-rays because as we said we need fast action from the start if we have a history of blunt abdominal trauma if the systolic blood pressure is less than 90 and if we have a palpable hematoma in the inguinal region the proximal thigh in the perineum called distal sign or in the flank called greater than sign this means that the patient may have unstable pelvis with significant amount of bleeding also, if you have leg length discrepancy, means that we may have a deformity caused by pelvic fracture. And of course, if you have wounds around the pelvis, especially from the hidden areas, from the rectum, vagina, and urethra. Still, we don't have x-rays. We don't need x-rays in this uh, situation. We need to save the patient's life first. Please, don't assess the instability of the pelvis manually.
some books were written uh, in the past and they go like this you see this is a pelvic hematoma after fracture and the clinician is pelvis opening and pulling the pelvis to see the pelvis uh, if the pelvis is stable or unstable what do you think about this let us see what will happen oh the hematoma will expand due to this big so this should not be done what we should do we should know if the patient is stable or stabilized before he came to the hospital or the patient is unstable and also we should guess about the pelvis as we said if it is fractured and if it is fractured or we suspect fracture of the pelvis we should know this the pelvis will be either stable or unstable the safe is to treat every pelvic fracture as unstable until proved otherwise and also to guess that the source of bleeding will be from the pelvis uh, and this will be also uh, to be proven or disproven later on when the patient is stabilized so the, the pelvis is the source of bleeding until proved otherwise so the first action is to compress the pelvis if you suspect pelvic fracture whatever the condition especially if the patient is unstable either by the binder or what's called pelvic so initial management and this is included in advanced trauma life support is to warp the patient to warm the patient and to fill the patient with fluid and the blood what's the next Next step is depending on the patient condition. If the patient is stable, is stabilized, and the pelvis now is in the binder, we will plan for definitive surgery. But if the patient is still unstable, we will go for damage control surgery to control bleeding from the pelvis surgically. If the patient is stable, we'll go for CT, fine CT images to know more about the injury and to plan for definitive management but again if the patient is unstable we will go for emergency CT maybe with contrast to know the sources of bleeding if we don't have CT we'll do at least x-rays and we'll go for damage control surgery to stop bleeding and temporarily stabilizing the pelvis by external fix damage control surgery the patient is transferred to the operative theater with the binder and the images are ready and then we can either go for what's called laparotomy to open and see the bleeding or angiography using radiography theater. Laparotomy is mostly indicated if we suspecting viscous organ injury like ruptured bladder, if the bleeding is active from uh, the vagina, from the urethra, we will go, we evacuate the hematoma and we will not search for the bleeding uh, source, but we will back the pelvis by these packs we will count the packs and we will go for external fixation of the pelvis and after 24 hours the patient if is stabilized we will go again to remove the packs and to control the bleeding what's called second if we are suspecting arterial bleeding especially if the initial hematoma is very large if we are suspecting solid organ injury like liver injury we will go for angiography and and by the end of laparotomy or angiography we will go for external fixator we have two points for fixation in the pelvis either the iliac crest or the anterior inferior iliac spine both are correct method for externally fixing the pelvic fracture what about the definitive management after the patient is stabilized our aims of definitive management will be to allow early with bearing to correct pelvic deformity if present to achieve union of the fractures and to decrease complications mainly pain and logical deficit we have two main methods non-operative treatment and operative treatment non-operative treatment are indicated in stable pelvis fractures with intact posterior arch minimal displaced fractures and in avulsion fractures while operative treatment is indicated in displaced fractures and unstable 
Operative treatment could be either per continuous screw fixation, if we don't need much reduction of the fracture or the dislocation. The classic example is minimally displaced sacral fractures or sacroiliac joint dislocation. Or formal overreduction in tenor fixation using blades and the screws, and this is classically indicated in iliac fractures and symphysis pubis disruption. External fixation of the anterior ring could be a definitive management method, especially if you have multiple comminuted fractures, which is difficult to treat by overreduction internal fixation. And last, if we have unstable lumbobelic function uh, uh, junction, I'm sorry, uh, we will go for what's called lumbobelic fixation. This is a case example of of what. Yes, this is an open book injury because we have opening of the symphysis pubis here and we have opening of the sacroiliac joint. But the opening is less than two and a half centimeters. This is the outlet view. There is no cephalic migration of the hemipelvis. This is the inlet view. There is no posterior migration of the hemipelvis. And we guess that this either type 1 or maybe type 2 and to posterior compression. So we can go for non-operative treatment if we agree that this is minimally displaced or if we are uh, in doubt we can go for fixation. In this we went for fixation by percutaneous minimal invasive surgery using what's called iliosacral screws and also a pubic ramus screw. If the opening is more than two and a half centimeters, like in this example, we'll go for double fixation, posterior fixation by again iliosacral screws, and anterior fixation by anterior external fixator. And here the injury is an open book, but it's an osseous fracture through the sacrum. The third and last example, if we have a lateral compression injury, but we have a bladder rupture due to fracture of this remi we'll go first for damage control surgery repair of the bladder control bleeding and external fixator of the pelvis and then we plan for definitive management by this iliosacral screw this is the ct scan of the same case showing the same mechanical injury as we discussed before lateral compression type 1 injury anterior remi fracture and posterior sacral fracture Complications of pelvic ring injuries include pain, which is the most common complication, either in the low back or inguinal pain, neurologic deficit, either motor deficit like L5 root injury causing foot drop, or sacral root injuries causing sexual dysfunction and urine or stool incontinence, deformity in form of leg length discrepancy and cosmetic disfigurement due to asymmetry of the pelvis, and lastly is the limbic. Our take-home message, number one, pelvic ring injuries are usually caused by high energy trauma. Number two, the most common cause of death after pelvic ring injury is bleeding. Number three, we should always apply binder in the ER before x-rays to save patient's life. Number four, damage control surgery of the injured pelvis means control of bleeding surgically and external fixation of the pelvic ring. Lastly, the aim of definitive management are aleoid bearing, prevent deformity, achieve union, and decrease pain and rigid damage, and definitive management is either operative or non-operative. Thank you.